Con Tampa Online. Uh, we're doing another one of our online interviews this afternoon. Of course, we're still not allowed to meet in person, so we're trying to carry on the tradition online here. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, be sure to post them underneath the live feed or to the right if you're looking at your PC. Today, we're excited to have Hank Hine, uh, the leader of the uh, Dali Museum. Hank, tell us about the impact of the Dali Museum. It draws people from all over the world. It's one of the great jewels of our area. Tell, tell us about uh, who it draws and how and, and what you all do, please. Sure, I will. I'm happy to do so, Bill. Happy to be with you and uh, your listeners at Cafe Con Tampa. Uh, so you can see I'm in the Dali Museum. Uh, aside from one kind of, uh, one, uh, two security and a couple of facility people uh, doing necessary improvements, those are the only people in the museum. And uh, that's quite a change from our normal impact. We usually would have around 400,000 people a, a year and we would have an economic impact well beyond what people actually pay to go to the Dali Museum. $150 million a year impact on the area uh, from visitors coming from all over the world. Uh, we get something like 80 countries um, and uh, in our season, which was interrupted by the COVID, uh, we would be seeing two or 3,000 people a day. So half a million visitors a year and uh, making quite an impact uh, and we're proud that the impact is also educational and they're seeing uh, artworks and they're seeing mediated experiments that uh, can't be seen anywhere else in the country. How many pieces did you say the Dali Museum has and, and how big is it compared to the one in uh, near Barcelona? Yeah, the one near Barcelona is in Figueres and it has, it started with largely the works that Dali hadn't sold when he died, but then they were very good about acquiring work. So it's a big collection. We have 2000 works and uh, ours is the most comprehensive collection of Dali in the world. Uh, it's, it's, it has works from every era, from the surrealist period to what he calls mystical um, uh, nuclear mysticism and everything that you might imagine Dali has done, you will find an example of here at the Dali Museum. Do we have the largest collection of, of what I would call the masterworks, the giant ones that he had to cut the hole through the floor to paint? Yeah, we, we have seven of those, Bill, and the uh, largest uh, accumulation anywhere else is three, I think, in, in Figueres. And um, can you tell us how, how uh, St. Petersburg and Tampa area um, got this collection? You know, it's a, it's a great story. It was totally by chance. And uh, the people who are responsible for a lot of it, uh, civically, are still alive, which is terrific. So one guy... Jim Martin uh, was a young uh, attorney. He just passed the bar. And when you pass the bar in the late 70s, the Wall Street Journal would give you a free trial subscription. So there's Jim. He's received his uh, free trial to the Wall Street Journal. He opens up the paper and he reads a headline that says, the art world dilly dallies about the dollies. And he reads it and it seems that this collection, the premier collection of one of a handful of the most important artists uh, for the last 200 years, <coughs> cannot find a home. This, this private collection is trying to give their collection to museums and the museums are trying to cherry pick it. So they have hundreds and hundreds of Dolly works, paintings, drawings, uh, prints, watercolors, sculptures, and uh, the uh, Cleveland Museum says, well, we'll take these three. And the Morrises, uh, Reynolds and Eleanor Morse, who put this collection together as a kind of love affair since the early 40s when they first met, their wedding gift to each other was a Dolly painting. Wow. They say, no, that's not why we put this collection together to, to give you three. You have to take them all. <coughs> so. They said, we can't take them all. Um, so that was the quandary that they were in. So the dilly-dallying was uh, museums not being able to figure out how they could accommodate this huge collection. Well, Jim Martin read that and uh, being 27 years old and uh, fresh and naive and energetic, he said, well, we ought to be able to bring that here to St. Petersburg, Florida. And he went to the mayor and the publisher of the St. Pete Times and his accountant. They said, great idea. Let's get the Morrises on the phone. 
And this is such an amazing story because have you ever seen those courtesy white phones, white courtesy yeah, phones in airport? airports? They got them on a white courtesy phone in an airport. And they said, uh, Mr. Morris, we're calling from St. Petersburg, Florida. And we'd like to offer you uh, a building for your collection. We'll take it all. And so the rest is, is history. And, and their son is still on the board, right? <coughs> their He's son the is still on the board and uh, their son's wife, Marianne, is on the board as well. So awesome. we have some legacy there. Yeah, and, and in the early days of the museum, I think they used to, uh, to wander around because that was their collection. They must have been really proud to see it. Um, and they didn't live to see the new museum, right? They saw the original one over by yeah, Unfortunately, they did not live to see the new museum, but... Uh, they uh, were very proud of the museum, did visit it all the time, and uh, were uh, really trained our docents personally in what Dolly intended with his artwork, which is a huge advantage. Yeah, and, and for anybody who's just tuned in, uh, if you have any questions, post uh, beneath the feed if you're on your phone or post to the right of the feed if, uh, if you're on your computer. We have uh, Hank Hine here talking about the, the Dolly Museum. And, uh, one of the areas that I'm really excited about is you have been um, an, an innovator in, uh, in using technology. I mean, you've got a, um, a, a virtual reality um, a DALI that you can interact with physically there. Uh, you've done virtu uh, virtual reality or augmented reality uh, with phones. Uh, tell us all about that. And, and you know, pre-COVID-19, what were you doing with technology and, and you know, what are your plans for the future with technology? Yeah, well, we, we really believe in technology. We've invested in technology. Uh, we get delight in uh, the way it amplifies Dolly's message and uh, particular satisfaction in the way our visitors seem to relate to it. It's a, it's a great way of um, <clears throat> mediation uh, between the self and the artwork through technology. It doesn't change or diminish the artwork. It just uh, makes it a little more accessible. And, and we have to use- that When you first walk in there, now there's this big uh, like flat screen TV, a dolly, and you can talk to him. You can ask him questions, and he sh and just to prove that he's real, he'll show you the Tampa Bay Times for that day, right? With the headline. <laughs> it is. It's the Tampa Bay Times uh, feed, and it, it's always he's carrying around that day's headline. And then, of course, we gave ourselves a free full page advertisement on the back of that paper. Um, and how, how, how? Why do you do all this with technology? Is that a personal passion of yours? A board passion or? <clears throat> I think, I think the motivation, Bill, is to try to reach people in the way they are accustomed to getting their information. So we have a, a newly technologically savvy population, and particularly younger people, and it's, it really makes the work much more accessible. Now, when I was in school, and when, uh, when you were in school, if you were studying art, you would learn how to have a kind of dialogue with... Um, a two-dimensional silent artwork. You could ask it what its terms are. Why are you shaped like this? You know, why that palette? But that's not part of the instructional mode anymore. So you need ways of uh, entering into the artist's mind and entering into the picture in a way that's intimate and bold. And so you so have um, you have virtual reality goggles. Hopefully, you're going to get more because there's always a long, <clears throat> even though it's kind of tucked behind some of the art. But you have these virtual reality goggles. And you guys have had these like five or six years, I think you were early adopters, and you can actually walk through a Dolly painting, uh, you know, one of the paintings that's on the wall. Can you uh, explain that to us and, and, and how it came about? Yeah, well, we've done a lot of shows of Dolly plus another artist. <clears throat> Probably our, our um, experiments with technology go back to, uh, we're inspired by Dolly, but we were inspired by uh, Andy Warhol when we did a show of his. And you remember he had these, these uh, what he called screen tests. He would uh, put up a 16 millimeter Bolex camera and one reel of film and set it down in front of his subject and turn it on and leave the room. And you were supposed to just look at the camera for three minutes. Uh, it's an amazing psychological test to look at a camera and to see what you start doing with your face and your eyes. Uh, so we uh, recreated that for our Warhol show and everybody had their three minutes of fame and we posted those online and people could uh, share uh, their experiences with you know, being Andy Warhol, uh, being the subject of Andy Warhol's films. So that was, that was a, an early thing. Um, 
other experiments with Dali, like um, the the uh, uh, the VR experience, which is called Dreams of Dali, came out of, again out of the kind of permission that Dali gives because of his interests in technology. Dali was a, a major innovator in technology. He actually made the first artist video back in 1959. Uh, nobody was working with video. Artists didn't experiment with film that much, but he was working with video and he made a, a, a video called Chaos and Creation. And it's really fun. It's, it's wow. partly impromptu, it's part performance art, it's improvised. It, it, it's it's wild. So he we took him as the uh, impetus. We took Dali, and uh, when we were looking at Walt Disney's work and doing a show about Disney and Dali, we thought, hey, if these guys were alive today, what would they they do? And we thought, well, they would make a VR. Um, and so we took one of Dali's paintings and imagined what it would be like to go into the painting, to explore it, to be able to walk around. And I have to say, we added a few things that weren't there in the painting. Uh, he had once collaborated with Alice Cooper. So we put Alice Cooper inside one of the ruins and you can hear Alice singing as you go through. So there's, yeah. it's, it's kind of a fun fest, but when you're done with that and you go back and look at that painting, this size that this is based on, you look at it in a new way and yeah, uh, it's a new way appreciative. Yeah. I don't know if people can see depending on the screen you're looking on, but it's like it's like the size of a of a big hand. And uh, suddenly you're inside, you're immersed in the whole thing. Okay, the other thing that you did, uh, what was it last year, was this augmented reality. You had the masterworks up and my kids uh, pulled out their phones and uh, they, you hold your phone, you have to have the app, you hold the phone up to the screen. I mean, you hold your phone up in front of the, the masterwork and then the pieces of it start to move and it explains to you uh, you know, what the, what the different components are. Um, can you explain that to us, please? Yeah, and your kids have been some of our great appreciators. It's, it's great that you've brought them again and again. That one is so educational because these are, we did this with the paintings that are called, called the masterworks and they're really anthologies of all his interests. So he spent a year on each of these paintings. So you can imagine with Dolly's mind that these things are really complicated paintings. And there's a lot of stories to tell within them. But uh, since they, uh, you know, it's static, it doesn't move, we wanted to animate and bring it alive. So if there's um, a dog in one section, we wanted to bring him out in three dimensions. Uh, and if there's uh, something moving in the painting like a bird, we want that bird to fly away. And uh, it allows you to see things in the paintings that um, a docent might point out to you but when they're animated, you appreciate them much more intensely and immediately. Yeah, you see so that them. was the motivation there. And some of that's online right now, isn't it? It's on your website. It and those, uh, it's, it's a, there's an app, a Dolly Museum app, just one app. And uh, if you hold, uh, when you open that app, if you hold it up to uh, a, one of those seven images, uh, you can experience it just in the pages of a book or on our website by just opening it up. So we, put, we took the museum and put it out into the world uh, in that way. And, and is the entire collection on the website now? Um, and what about the Dreams of Dali? Uh, any of that on the website? Uh, the Dreams of Dali is, is on the website. You can find it, uh, but it's only the uh, VR. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's only the video version of it. You'd have to have, you know, uh, you'd have to have that pack uh, for your phone. Um, to, to the VR pack in order to experience it in, in virtual reality where you can actually navigate. And you also put the the recent exhibit, we'll get to that in a minute, I think you wanna show a video, but we had a question real fast. If anybody has questions, please post them under the feed or if you're watching on PC to the right. Um, we had a question about the the quote unquote new museum. Um, can you tell us the, the story about how, I, I think you were in charge when you moved, right? Tell us the story about how it moved and, and, and what you built there and why. Okay, well, you know, we had a really practical reason for building this building. It was, it was opened in uh, 2011. It was on, opened on January uh, 1st, January 11th at 11 o'clock in 2011. Um, uh, actually about 11-11 uh, on the 11th. We were a little late starting. Uh, but that building uh, was born of a necessity, and that is that the, the building we were in was a, a, a very impermanent structure. It was a, kind of a lean-up walled warehouse, 
a marine warehouse and it, it didn't uh, first of all protect the collections against uh, the storm hazard that we have here in Florida and it also just didn't give the amenities uh, that we we have uh, now and that visitors come to expect that is a theater for orientation an assembly place a cafe things that can make the experience much fuller and more pleasurable so we put, we put that together when I explain it to people, tell me this is wrong, and, and you give me a tour, Jan Weymouth's giving me tours. I The way I think of it is because of hurricanes now, that was a worry with the old building that it got, might get blown away, right? So you've got this very valuable collection. You've got kind of two huge concrete bunkers, part of it you can see behind you, and then connect it with this glass, and then you've got the double helix behind you. Um, can you just talk on a highlight about some of the design elements? Yes, uh, so that double, that helix behind us, um, is is a, a beautiful, elegant rendering by Jan Weymouth uh, of an idea I had to actually make a double helix. And uh, I wanted to have a double helix elevator, escalator. And okay. so that you could, uh, that, you know, in a double helix, the two strands never meet. So you would be going up or down and you would see people going around the circle, you'd never con contact them. Um, uh, but uh, Jan Weymouth disavowed me of that, showing me the repair statistics on escalators. They're down about 60% of the time. So, um, and, and then he had a nice design for a double helix staircase. And we took that to, to my governing board and they asked me a really difficult question, really unfair, I think. They said, uh, Hank, how much more does a double helix cost than a single helix? And uh, I think, Bill, you can, uh, just to uh, truth in advertising here, mention that you are a trustee of the, of the Dolly Museum too. And you can imagine being in that fiduciary responsibility and, and, and having to say, you know, how much more is it for a double helix? Well, it was twice as much. So, so we ended up with one very beautiful helix. But the, the museum is spectacular. Um, we lavished attention in the public areas but it's rather economically built. It was built in the last uh, recession. Um, it, was, it was built for like uh, $400 a square foot, which is pretty amazing. And, um, and now you know as well that we're looking to expand and create a, a second attached building uh, just to engage people in interactive shows. Yeah, so the uh, Dolly we, has, has announced, what he's about to say, the Dolly has announced a big expansion um, uh, which I think has been approved by the county and other groups. And um, it was slowed down a little bit maybe by COVID-19. But tell us, sorry, I interrupt you. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, so we've been encouraged that the, the county uh, has promised support from the uh, tourist taxes to which we you know, contribute uh, mightily ourselves. But uh, it will drive a lot more visitors because it's going to be a kind of um, a mediated fun house in the sense of educational, but also interactive and very, very uh, instructive and diverting. So we're looking forward to opening opening uh, a new building maybe in three years. And, it, and it'll have a multi-story parking garage with it too, right? Plus some new technology VR areas. Yeah, it will. And the, the parking area will be convertible to, uh, to museum use if at such time uh, the need and use of automobiles decreases. One thing you have to remember about the, the, the Dali is this is the, the most important collection of, of, of a handful of artists. The, there may be only one or two other collections that are as important to an, a major artist in the whole country. Uh, Philadelphia has the Duchamp collection. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we take very seriously. We have a, a real generational responsibility. Uh, this building was built for 100 years standards, and uh, we're looking to keep this uh, interesting through technology for a couple of more generations. Let me ask you if I remember correctly, um, in, when, when Jan talks about it, and maybe when you talk about it, um, tell me if this is wrong, but the glass on the front, uh, so you take a, kind of two concrete bunkers, you put this beautiful dolly ass glass, but Jan was telling me that he had met um, Buckminster Fuller and Dali was friends with Buckminster Fuller and, and that Bucky Fuller designed the glass that goes over the, the, Dali, the uh, Dali Museum in Spain. Is that, did I remember that correctly or not? 
Yeah, Dolly um, adopted it from the, the Bucky Dome. And the one in, in Spain is the classic Buckminster Fuller Dome, all regular hexagons, uh, about two thirds of a globe. Uh, uh, we created something um, that's a little different. It's the next generation of Buckminster Fuller Dome uh, because it's been morphed. It's a regular dome that's been morphed. And so all the hexagonal uh, angles are changed and there are no two triangles that are the same, no two hexagons that are the same, no intersecting planes that are the same. In fact, we have 1,064 panes of glass that are each a different dimension. Yeah, it's just fascinating. Um, you know, that was a question that somebody asked, but the building itself is a is a, a monumental piece of art, and then it houses one of the best art collections in the, in the world. Uh, another question, uh, Robin Nye, who's the uh, public art person with the city of Tampa, says hi, and she also says, um, um, with the innovative work you've done with technology and making your collections available, any thoughts uh, how this might translate to an outdoor environment? Uh, well, outdoors, uh, that is outside any walls is a different question. We, we take a lot of our uh, art outside this building. Uh, of course, educationally, we try to be in every school through our volunteers. We have a Dolly Mobile. Uh, actually, it's a collaboration with Pinellas County um, where it's a, it's a trailer, like a construction trailer that's moved by the county to every, every school within the county, every public school with, and some of the private schools within the county as well. And uh, it uses Dolly's art to provide instruction in uh, mathematics and proportion, which is uh, so critical to uh, elementary and middle school education. But in terms of uh, being out in the, in the, the elements, um, we haven't had any forays there except for our beautiful garden, which does have Dolly sculptures in it currently. And then we have, um, and I'm sure you know, Robin, we have that, that terrific uh, labyrinth, this hedge labyrinth which is a, a wonderful meditative structure you walk through. And uh, a labyrinth, of course, is that unicursal maze where you can make no wrong turns. All you have to do is have faith and you get to your destination. So it's a great pleasure for our visitors. <clears throat> Tell us about this recent exhibit, uh, the uh, Midnight Paris. And I think you have a short video to show us and that that exhibit is now online. Am I correct? Uh, it is online. Uh, we, you know, we were only about two thirds through the run of that when we were first closed by the Grand Prix and then closed by COVID. COVID. So um, we thought that this is a, a wonderful show. This is essentially the collection in surrealism of the Pompidou Museum in Paris. So that's the National Modern Art Museum in France. So this is one of the best collections of surrealism in the world, and they loaned it to us for this show. Um, because there are so many different artists in it, we decided that it didn't really carry on its own the way that a Dali exhibition does. That is, it needed some explanation. So being uh, more and more uh, adept in technology and more and more interested in using technology, we decided to create a film and this is a, a little trailer of the film, which uh, essentially uh, gives you the sense the setup for the 30-minute film. This is a 30-second trailer. But I want to show you the 30-second trailer, and you'll see what's at, uh, how we did this. Yeah, and while you're bringing it up real fast, um, it is available on your website, right? The longer version is there, plus the collection is available. Yes, yes. So it's an it online is. exhibition if anybody's interested. And uh, what's your website, dolly.org or something? The Dolly. Dot org. Dolly dot org. Okay. All right. I'll run this. Oops. That's, that's not the one I was going to run. All right. Let's look again.
So there you have it. So uh, Andre Breton was the, the guy who invented the, the uh, movement of surrealism. And uh, he was very doctrinaire and wanted to control all of the surrealist artists to make work that he thought was consistent with his ideas. And Gala, equally controlling of Dali, uh, was trying to nurture uh, Dali. Uh, and uh, the two of them were fighting for control. So we thought this gave a great sense of the issues involved in surrealism. And we make them really digestible in this conversation, which is kind of like a, my dinner with Andre between Gala, Dolly's wife, and Andre Breton, the theory. It's a shame. It's a shame that people can't see the actual exhibition. I mean, that you know, from the architecture outside to the landscaping to the the display of the art uh, to the VR and technology to um, uh, to to how you show your exhibitions. I mean, everything is thought through so well. I particularly liked the Disney one a couple of years ago. I mean, every one has its elements. The food one was fantastic. Um, so anyway, that's all available online now, right? Anything, any other exhibitions available online? Well, uh, this active exhibition called uh, Dolly Lives is, is online as well. And uh, this is something that uh, we've been really delighted with, and we're going to make it more uh, interactive than it is now. But essentially, you see a life-size Dolly uh, that was created by artificial intelligence. So uh, this is an AI experiment to bring Dolly back to life and uh, we think we we bring him back pretty well um, it, it's interesting to see how it was put together so i'm going to uh, run a, a, a couple minute video that shows you how we put this together uh, why we put it together and what visitors will see when they come to the dolly great and while you're while you're pulling that up i'll put a little add in um, as as Hank said, I'm I happen to sit on his board, uh, but but pick your favorite museum and please get their website and their online exhibitions and share them with your friends because we need um, we need to promote our museums as much as possible now. Uh, you know every museum in the world, every art organization in the world uh, needs support, uh, monetary support, uh, views and clicks, and so you know please share the. Uh, these exhibitions that you can find in the Dali Museum, but but every other museum in the Tampa Bay region and whatever your favorite museum is or art group around the world, please. Do you see that, Bill? Yeah. Okay. Greetings. I am Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenech, and I am back. Even though Dali's been gone for 30 years, we're using artificial intelligence to bring him back today. In order to actually train this AI to, to reproduce Dali's likeness, we've started with finding the right footage of Dali, and then we split that up into frames where he's, he's looking the right way, and you pick the best frames to use for training from that. Our system learns exactly what he looks like and how his, his mouth moves and how his eyes move and his eyebrows and every little detail about what makes Dali Dali. This is actually a recreated version of Dali. It's not a person playing Dali with makeup. It is actually Dali. We're very careful to use his words um, so that you learn a lot about what he thought and the way he thought. People want access to art. They want a way in. It can be through technology, through learning about the artist. Greetings. Welcome. This technology allows people to imagine for a moment that there is such a thing as immortality, to see Dolly alive again. The whole future of Dali is explained in 
Le Brother Painting. I saw Dali, but like his actual form, full figure, speaking personally to me. He was welcoming to the museum, to his art, and like, I still have goosebumps. <laughs> it is good to be back. Um, he talked about the museum and his paintings. There comes a moment in every person's life when they realize they adore Dali. In your life, this moment will also be known as Wednesday. Go tell it to your friend. Mr. Dali, <laughs> very life. Before you leave, you will take a picture with me. Alor. Uno, dos, tres. Music bed. Ooh la la. <laughs> would you like me to send you this dream photograph? Follow the instructions. What that adds is a sense of emotion. If they can empathize with this man as a human being, then they can relate to the work much more directly, much more passionately. To understand the art, you need to understand the artist behind the art. And this, this technique allows visitors of the Dali Museum to do just that. I don't see anybody get, I get chills watching that. I do not believe in my death. Do you? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. What a, I was getting goosebumps too. And I do every time I go there and, you know, you really feel like you're talking to him and th there's some version of that on the website too, right? Yes. Yes, there is. And, and some of the, I don't know about that one in particular, but some of the AR work that you've done um, is done by uh, local firms in St. Pete, right? Right. Uh, and this movie uh, that we shot was shot at the Cassis restaurant on a Monday night with a, a, a local um, um, a local filmmaker and um, local actors. And I, th I think it really looks good. It looks terrific. Yeah, and, and we've had uh, our digital interactive things done with locally. And then we also have a relation to uh, one of our board members uh, company in San Francisco, Goodby Silverstein, uh, who has helped us with some of this as well. It just shows the amazing talent that we have um, throughout our region and, and how the, all these collaborations go on. And, and I'll ask you two other quick questions and, and I'll let you go. But that ties into uh, uh, creativity in the arts as an economic engine. I mean, you're, the museum itself is a huge economic engine because you have people flying in from all over the world to go to the museum and they spend money in hotels and restaurants. But also you, it, it inspires people and supports other arts related industries um, so, uh, it uh, causes little kids even to think innovate, uh, innovatively so that they can uh, create new ideas. Can you just address that a little bit? Well, I think that uh, there's so much creativity in the human being uh, and uh, it's like uh, water um, carving a path. When you see something creative, uh, there's a little groove in your mind that has less resistance to new ideas. And so you can follow those. And, and that's totally what our mission is. Our mission is to enable people to make their lives more the way they want them using innovative ideas. And we think that art is the most innovative uh, undertaking possible. So th through demonstrating our innovation, we encourage others to be creative themselves. Great. And my, my last question, um, you're, so you got this big collection from the Morrises, but you're adding to it. Um, can you tell us how much you've added uh, since the beginning and how much you add a year or every few years? Well, the Morris uh, collection is really the foundation of the Dali Museum. Uh, the, most of the great paintings uh, were collected by Reynolds and Eleanor Morris. We've been adding things that related to the core of their collection a few paintings here and there, uh, drawings certainly that were important, some photographs. Uh, we're just trying to augment the collection 
but uh, we're eternally indebted to the Morrises for their bequest. And uh, I think St. Petersburg, um, if you travel around the world, people know St. Petersburg as the home of the Dali Museum. And we're so proud that we can put the city on the map in that way. I think it's important to to let people know that even though uh, Dali passed away 30 years ago or so, and and uh, you know the Morris's uh, parents passed away, um, it, the museum is still growing and evolving uh, using technology, new art, um, and and a lot of it has to do uh, with other donors. I mean, one of the big donors also, just to name one name, I can remember Tom James, who even has his own museum now, but is still a big contributor. Um, uh, so, you know, thanks to everybody who's helping to grow and thank you for keeping it alive and, um, and, and engaging us in creativity and innovation in our community. Any final thoughts or suggestions? Uh, when we're open, come visit. We'll have some marvelous things for you to experience. And be sure, anybody who has kids or grandkids, be sure to take them too because they love it and they'll love all the technology that's there too. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everything and uh, look forward to having you back again, hopefully in, uh, in person sometime. Thank you, Bill. Good luck. Thanks to all of you. Bye-bye.